Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, in the next 40 minutes, I'll be talking about how we can leverage uh, FIRE uh, to improve the clinical research process. Um, starting off, who I am. Uh, Sebastian Kneidelberg. I'm from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, I have a background in medical informatics. And after my uh, master's, I got enrolled in a PhD uh, that was very clinically research oriented. Uh, in pediatric oncology, I researched website usability and did a lot of epidemiological studies as well. And that basically learned me that as a researcher, you have to invent the wheel yourself over and over and again. If you start off as a junior, you have to think about how you collect your data, uh, build your own first Excel spreadsheets, then a Microsoft SQL database, merge all the data sources you can get into that one database. And I was quite lucky because I had an informatics background and I could manage all that, but most of my colleagues couldn't. So when I left after six years, I was basically the only one in our research group that could manage all the data sets that were going around. Um, that resulted in uh, my next position at Castor EDC. Um, I'm the CTO there. Uh, we have an online platform where researchers can actually uh, build their own research databases online and don't need the technical expertise to actually do so, so they can focus on their domain and their research instead of on the technicalities. Um, I'd also like to know a little bit about you. Um, for starters, raise your hands. Who has experience here with FIRE in general? That's to be expected uh, at a FIRE conference. Um, who's working hands-on with clinical data on a daily basis? 50%. Who is doing clinical data management, research data management within FIRE? All right. And who has written a scientific paper here and actually done research? Oh, that's a little bit more, actually. Nice. Um, well, for starters, I'd like to walk you a little bit through the uh, clinical research process. How does uh, a research uh, project work? And let's take the example of um, uh, hypertension, new, uh, new hypertension medicine. Um, you think that this new medicine uh, can lower the blood pressure in uh, hypertensive patients. That's your hypothesis. And you want to test that. So you create an experiment where you give this medication to a patient at, or to a group of patients and you uh, compare that to a group of patients that you don't give it to or you give them placebo. You write that down in a very strictly defined protocol where you uh, write down, I want to know these parameters, these are my outcomes, and I'm going to do the analysis like this. Then when the protocol gets approved, you start looking for either existing data or you start seeing uh, patients. Usually, especially in prospective research, you uh, say, given the hypertension ex uh, example, for example, um, I'm going to give these patients this medication from moment zero up till moment 24, month 24. And every two months, we'll do some measurements and be collect data uh, newly from these patients, we send surveys, and we use data from an existing source, for example, the laboratory information management system. Then in the end, you combine all these data sets uh, together in a single SPSS file or other statistical um, analysis format, and you do your statistical analysis. In the end, you write on the results in a scientific paper, you submit it to the highest ranked journal you can find, you get declined, you rewrite it again, you go to a lower ranked journal until you finally get published. And um, in the end, if you are a good researcher, you'd also like to publish your data so that people can actually validate that the research you did was uh, scientifically sound. All sounds logical, logical steps, however, uh, oh yeah, one more. You have to adhere to regulations from the start to the finish, of course. <coughs> Problem, however, is that this process is basically flawed in many, many ways. Um, looking at the hypothesis creation, um, all over the world people are executing the same research projects. Um, no one knows what they're doing in the other side of the world. So lots of duplication instead of collaboration. Um, the protocols that are being written are often heterogeneous, um, which means that you can't compare the outcomes of the different trials that are being con uh, conducted. Reusing existing data, it's a real pain. Um, in my six years doing research, trying to get all the data you need from the sources you want, very hard. Usually it just boils down to copying data and writing it over manually. When you want to capture new data, you need tooling around it as well. Uh, survey tools, electronic data capture tools like Cast3DC, 
are often very hard to use, um, complex, expensive. Um, I must say, Castor, of course, is the exemption there. Um, then when you have all your data collected, you want to analyze it. Um, if you have multiple data sources, and especially if they, those sources come from uh, public data sets containing uh, um, private or uh, personally identifiable information, you have to link them uh, in a secure way, usually via trusted third party that can be uh, expensive and the linking process is uh, taking lots of time. And in the analysis, um, basically everyone is reinventing the wheel as well. No one um, has a standard way of doing uh, the statistical analysis. And oftentimes it boils down to, let's try as many statistical analysis until we find the, res the results that we actually want to find, uh, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then uh, in the end, if the results uh, and your statistical massaging didn't really work, you don't publish at all, which creates a large publication bias. Um, and when you publish, it usually gets published as a PDF file or in print, um, which is very hard to reuse. You have to manually read it, and usually you have to pay a lot of money also to access that research. research. And then if people already publish their data, which is um, luckily uh, increasing lately, but even if they do, oftentimes it's very hard to reuse that data because it's often just a CSV file with uh, limited headers, and you don't know what's actually meant by all those data columns. And when it comes to regulations, um, in the commercial space, this is very strictly regulated and everyone um, adheres. In the academic world, I must say from personal experience as well, I had no idea what regulations to comply with at all. That's improving as well, training is improving, but oftentimes the researcher just doesn't know. So, how can we use FIRE um, to improve a lot of these problems? And I think that, that FIRE and data standardization in general can really help uh, advancing medical research at a quicker pace than uh, that currently is the case. Um, a few examples, and uh, the one that I'll be focusing on today is the automated uh, uh, data exchange uh, to get data from its source to an electronic data capture platform. But other examples, patient recruitment. If you need to do your hypertension trial, you want to find patients with a high blood pressure. And instead of going to 50 cardiologists and asking them, in the next two months, can you please include patients you encounter, you can also use a fire server and query all those patients that are actually right there right now. Um, another use case, consent management. Right now, informed consent is always a painful process. It contains, uh, it, you have to have written, uh, printed, wet signatures on a form that state, I consent to have this research done on me and I consent to the fact that my data is used for these purposes. That is of course very good, consent is very important, but the fact that it's a wet signature makes it very hard to actually implement it digitally. And luckily there is a fire consent research, uh, resources um, that are already there and the uh, fire implementation guide for research consent management is actually in the making. And last but not least, device integration is a very good use case for leveraging FIRE for research as well. Um, basically, everyone is walking around with a smartphone these days, with a smartwatch, collecting data that can be relevant for medical research continuously. Um, FIRE can, of course, really uh, make the process easier to get that data out of its source and into a data capture platform so that we can use the data for, uh, for research. Um, this afternoon, there is a nice talk uh, at uh, 350, I think, about how we can use uh, devices and fire data from devices. So be there if you're interested. But my focus for today will lie on automation uh, of electronic data capture via data exchange. Mm. So like I said, research data is often of a highly structured nature. You write your protocol very early in the process. In that protocol, you define which data elements you want to capture. Uh, which risk factors you want to know about, the gender, um, and all that usually is, can be expressed in a simple spreadsheet, basically. The data that you want to capture is usually also already available. The research projects are often carried out within the regular care environment, so your lab measurements, your blood pressures are already available in an electronic health record. But then as a researcher, you need to collect that data and make that spreadsheet to do your analysis, and that's usually a standalone app, whether it's Access or Excel. God forbid, because, yeah. uh, but you have a custom made database just for your research project, especially if, if large projects have a lot of funding, people resort to, let's build a app just for us to collect this data. 
or whether you people use an electronic data capture tool like CAST or OpenClinica, RedCap, um, it's always a standalone tool. You can never do the research from just within the EHR. That means that researchers oftentimes have to just type data over and over again. All the data that's available already digitally needs to be copied manually to a research database. Um, a business case written by one of the Dutch uh, university hospitals calculated that they could spare uh, almost 70 FTE if they could automate all that data transcription from the EHR to research databases and quality registrations. Besides the large time, uh, time savings that can be made there, there's also a very good case to be made that it can save a lot of um, quality issues. If you type data over from one screen to your second screen all day, and even if you pay a lot of attention, you will make mistakes. It's estimated that the risk of, of the, the rate of transcription errors is between 10 and 20%. So that's really, really painful, especially if you use that data to actually do research with that may change the course of the medical world. Then if you can already manage to uh, get your hands on an export of a lab system or another uh, part of the EHR that you want to get data of, Usually you have to wait for a very long time to a, get it, and then you have to program the linkage yourself uh, or ask people to do that. So huge case to actually do this via fire. Um, if we can expose all this data via fire and import it into your database via fire, you can save a lot of time and perhaps even more importantly, improve the quality of your research project a lot. So uh, a few years after we started with Castor EDC, um, we started building a fire integration together with some of the Dutch uh, academic hospitals. And right now we've connected four of the uh, university hospitals to our system. And we started off very simple um, with just two resources, the patient resource and the observation resource, because actually these contain a lot of the data that's being transcribed manually all the time. Many research projects just rely on lab data. So why not start with that? Um, over time, it uh, turned out hospitals have their own rules, their own infrastructure, um, so we couldn't just have a one-size-fits-all solution. So right now we have two uh, architectures in production, uh, one where the hospital creates fire messages itself and pushes it to the outside world, to us, and one where the hospital allows fire messages to be pulled from inside the hospital premises uh, from a fire server. So let's go into a little bit more detail. For the push mechanism, um, there is a broker application in place that takes care of building the fire messages. It uses usually is a, a, a cron job that runs nightly and that queries the clinical uh, or re the research data warehouse for data about patients. Then it checks, is this patient actually enrolled in any research projects? And is that a research project that's also being uh, run in Castor in our system? If that's the case, uh, the broker application uh, builds a fire bundle with all the new resources that were uh, created over the last couple of days or the last day, creates a message and sends that to the research application to us. We do a little bit of pre-processing. We read for which study is this data uh, uh, pointing and for which patient within the study. Then we store it and we wait for the researcher to actually come online. We send them a not notification and the researcher will parse the data from it, the fire message, map it to the right place within the study and save it. And I'll come back to it in a little bit uh, on how that actually works. Um, there is a few considerations for this mechanism. Um, big pro is that the hospital has full control over which data goes to which recipient. And this is something that especially security officers uh, very uh, like very much. Um, as you have a standalone application that takes care of the querying of the data sources and building the fire messages, you can basically connect any data source you want. So you, the hospital gets a lot of flexibility in the data that they uh, uh, can expose. Um, notifications can be sent to the researcher when new data becomes available, and that's nice. So the researcher doesn't have to check in on a daily or weekly basis to see, is there new data for my patients? No, they can actually be notified. And as it's a custom application, you can basically use whatever you want. You can use the C-sharp fire components, happy components. We've seen hospitals use Microsoft BizTalk to um, do the message, message brokering. Cloverleaf can do it, and basically you can build whatever you want yourself. And that's directly also one of the negative points. You have to build it yourself. There is no one-size-fits-all solution here. And it means that within the hospital, you have to have IT resources to build and maintain this. 
Um, the next, step, next point is that if there is no data negotiation in place, um, this is just a simple data dump, which means that you are creating a copy of your electronic health record if you just keep on sending all the new data of these patients every day to an external data source. And that means that the recipient, we become responsible for the storage and handling of that. And that's something that I personally dislike. We don't want to have a copy of an electronic health record of a hospital on our premises. Um, and last, you have to consider which push interval to use. If your broker runs every night or every hour, you have a lot of fire messages to burn through as a researcher to parse and to process. On the other side, if you do it monthly, you have huge fire messages, especially if you do research, for example, within the intensive care and you want to have some vital signs on one specific date point uh, for your study, and you have to browse through the data of a month, that's a very painful and perhaps more time consuming process than just looking up the value yourself in the EHR and manually typing it over. So mostly for the reasons that we don't want to handle that data all the time ourselves, um, we started looking into an alternative and that's the pool mechanism. Um, here the process starts with a researcher um, who actually wants to know, is there any data for my patient, um, lab data, whatever I want, is there any data that I'm interested in, interested in available in the EHR. And we then transform their question into a fire query and send that to a fire server that hosts within the hospital premises. Um, you have to notice there the big firewall line, every hospital of course has a firewall, and there's a VPN connection to go in there. Um, if you don't mention this explicitly, usually hospital security officers start to freak out directly. Um, so this is always in place, it has to be secure. The fire server internally processes the, the, the query, um, and whether it's a full-blown fire server itself or a facade that queries underlying data sources, um, doesn't really matter. In the end, it builds the fire message and returns that um, to the research application to us. We do the same pre-processing that we do as with the push mechanism, and then show the results directly to the end user, who can then map the data from the fire messages to the right place within his study protocol for that patient checks that everything's correct, and then saves everything in the database. Um, the big pro here is, of course, that we only retrieve the necessary data. You do a query, you want to know all the glucose, serum electrolytes, whatever values you want. We, query, we send that with the query to the uh, fire server so that we only retrieve the data that is of interest for the research. Another big pro is that you have a live view of the underlying data sources. Um, live is here between quotes because oftentimes the research data warehouse is a daily or weekly updated repository clone of the um, live electronic health record. But at least it's um, a direct view on the underlying data source, which makes it especially useful for uh, uh, historical data. If you will do a uh, project, you usually want to know the history of your patients. Did they have a high blood pressure? for 10 years already, 20 years. Uh, what's their comorbidity and the family history? Um, the data stays at the source, so we don't have to be afraid of um, any leaks on our side. And you have all the functionality of a fire server available, which means that you can do uh, build extensive queries on code systems, uh, date ranges, et cetera. Um, one of the harder parts with a fire server is that you have to provide access control. This fire server is just a single server that has to uh, expose all the data of all the patients that are um, in the underlying data sources. But which researchers have access to which data? Um, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Research is usually um, pseudonymized, which means that there's no personally identifiable information directly in uh, the research project. And it's usually not allowed either. So the fire server shouldn't give out social security numbers, um, address details, names. Um, so that's, that needs to be taken into account. And of course, it's fun to say, let's just query the fire server, but that also means that there has to be a fire server on, in the hospital. Um, luckily, more and more hospitals, at least in the Netherlands, what we see, are interested in actually building this, and especially academic centers are um, quickly catching up. But it also means that someone internally needs to take care of this and manage this. For both the push and the pull architecture, um, there's a set of common challenges uh, that need to be taken into account. Um, Every hospital has its own way to manage um, uh, study management. Uh, 
which studies are there, uh, which trials are running, which registries, which quality registrations do we have to uh, collect data for. And every hospital has its own ways to actually enroll patients within studies um, and keep track of who, has, uh, who is in which study, basically. Um, oh, on top of that, is research data usually pseudonymized, like I just said. And the combination of these two points uh, boils down to the fact that for every hospital, we have to build a specific implementation on how we identify studies and patients within the fire server or within the fire messages. And the most straightforward way is to have the research pseudonym, the unique research identifier for this patient, stored within the EHR, and use that within the fire messages to identify the patient. Another alternative that we've seen is that, you, that we can store the hospital identifier in the EDC system, the, the hospital information number of a patient, you can store that. But that's already a little bit more tricky because the hospital information number is already identifying to a single uh, indiv individual, so not really <laughs> optimal. And what we've used the most is to actually combine the internal hospital study identifier and then a colon or another um, uh, character as a, a separator and then the pseudonym within that study as the patient identifier within the fire patient resource. Um, the reason why I say colon or another character is because a colon is not a valid URL character. So if you use that, you will actually have errors in your queries if you really use a fire server. So it's better to use a dot or a dot dot or something else. Um, this way, if we get a fire message in, we just parse the first part. We know which study, research study, the, the data is about. And then within that study, we can look up the pseudonym for that specific patient and map that data to the right patient within our system. A great alternative for this would be that we can use the research study and research subject resources that are, uh, have just been published in R4 for the first time. Um, and that's something that we're currently looking into. Another challenge is authentication and authorization. And this is mostly for the fire server in the hospital, like I just said. Um, you want to make sure that if you're a researcher, you can't just access all the patients in the fire server, but that you only have access to the patients that you have, should have access to, and perhaps also only the data points that you should have access to. And that's why we've been working together with one of the academic hospital centers um, to build an architecture to ensure that no one can access data that they shouldn't have access to. And that starts off again with a researcher here within a research application like, like us, and they want to query the fire server. Now first, they identify themselves with the identity provider, usually an Active Directory server. That's checking whether the researcher that's asking for uh, authentication, to which studies they actually have access to. That data is returned with the uh, OAuth uh, scopes um, and a large context for, for example, a single research subject. Together with the JSON web token, that's actually the authorization, uh, authentication token, which is then used when requesting data from the fire server. The fire server checks whether the token that was supplied is actually a valid token with the identity provider. If that's the case, then actually starts reading the data of a specific research subject. Um, we can link the research subject like a patient resource to all the other resources uh, that are um, required and query, that are being queried for. And then that gets re returned um, to the, the researcher and he can process it furthermore. This is already a big improvement over just exposing all data via a single account that we've used before as well. Um, but actually it's not secure enough yet. And that's mostly because the scopes here uh, that Smart on Fire actually sports are not fine-grained enough. Um, if you have patient uh, star.read to read all the data of a specific patient, you may expose a lot more info than the researcher actually should have uh, access to. If you're doing a diabetes research project, there is no need to know the HIV status of this patient and vice versa. However, there's currently no way to limit this within Smart on Fire. So tomorrow afternoon, we have a small uh, pop-up session to actually brainstorm how we can improve this. Um, and there's another Smart on Fire related breakout session this afternoon as well. So if you're interested in this topic, please join. Um, then we have a fire message within our research application. That's great. However, it's a fire message and we have a 
structured database that we need to map this data to. So in your study protocol, uh, you need to define where the data needs to go. Um, this is a, a screenshot from our system, uh, a protocol definition where you see that um, for a random study, there is an inclusion phase, there's a set of follow-up visits, and for each visit, there's a set of forms which are on the right side. Inclusion data, demographics, lab measures, uh, etc. And a study form within the protocol would look something like this. It's just a regular form. You know them from the internet. Um, a set of input uh, fields where you can enter data. In this case, it's an example of a urine culture um, with a set of urine variables. So how do we know which fire data to map to the form structure here? We defined a way to uh, do this with metadata on the form fields. So for every field within your study, you can define metadata where you say this data point, this, for example, here on the screenshot, it's a red blood cell count within the urine. This is relating to a fire observation. And from this fire observation, we want to store the value. Then which fire observations can we map to this, um, to this field? We use codable concepts for this. So in this case, we have a, a loin code or a laboratory information uh, code that says these are observations that can actually map to this data point. Um, like I said in the, in the beginning, a medical researcher actually is usually not very technical. So defining this for perhaps 500 fields in a study is a no-go. However, these codes and these settings are actually quite generic, so you can build a search interface for this, and there's a find metadata at the bottom of the, of the screenshot. You type in erythrocytes, and you get a set of potential um, metadata mappings. And once you've made one form and annotated it, you can actually reuse that same form through your study and also throughout your entire hospital. Um, if you have these codes that are often sadly hospital specific, um, you can reuse that. And that hospital specific part is, I think, a, a very painful part because it means that you have to reinvent the wheel again from hospital to hospital. And it would be great if um, hospitals or um, professional uh, user groups would come together and say, all right, for lab measurements, for research, we will always use loin codes or SNOMED codes, but at least have a sort of agreement uh, so that not every hospital has to reinvent the wheel. Then, if the fire message is in our system, um, it still needs to go to the right place within the study. Even if you have your metadata codes that says this is a urine measurement of red blood cell count, there may be five of these in time in your study, so you still need to map them. Um, luckily, because there's time points in your study, usually you can do this by dates. So on the left side, you see here a list of um, blood measurements, um, hemoglobin in this case, uh, from a single fire message containing lots of historical data. Um, and then you can actually select a date range um, for every visit in your study, and the system can do the rest. You can directly map all the incoming data straight to the right place within your study. Um, in this case, it's quite easy because there's only a single measurement per date. So that's one size, one selection fits all. You can push everything through and save. But if there's more than one measurement for a specific date, you still have to make a manual selection as a researcher. We cannot, as a system, decide for you which of the five measurements from that specific day uh, you are interested in. If there's only one, we can just automate that selection. And as a researcher, you can directly save and continue. This is already great, uh, saving lots of time for researchers um, sitting behind the computer. But it would be even better if this can be done from within the electronic health record. And that's where um, people have been thinking about smart things already for a long time. And the Structured Data Capture Implementation Guide is there for this reason. The uh, SDCIG provides infrastructure to standardize and automate data capture, not with an external tool, but from within the EHR directly. Um, it's based on the IHE RFD standard. This has been around for quite some time. And that looks like this. And here you have the EHR system. Um, a patient gets registered for a specific trial, and the EHR can then actually send a request for a specific form to a form or template repository. And that can then be basically your EDC tool or any other form library that's on the back end. The form gets sent back to the EHR, 
and can actually also be pre-populated. There is resources that can actually specify these are the questions and we can grab the data from these places within the EHR. The populated form gets displayed to the end user, the missing data can be completed by the researcher, and the completed form gets posted as a, structured, or as a questionnaire response to the external data repository, which can be anything. And in the end, you can use the final results for your research project. Um, the SCIG provides profiles for the form definitions, the questionnaires, the questionnaire responses, value sets, code systems, and common data elements. So um, this is, I think, for us the next step. Um, and there's luckily been some work in this field already. So we'll be looking into this soon. There's another big pro of using FIRE for research purposes, and that's that it improves the fairness of data. Uh, FAIR is an uh, acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it's a set of 16 um, guidelines uh, that were written down three or four years ago uh, by the, the FAIR group. And that state that all the data that's used for research and basically all the data in general should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as much as possible. And that's not just about the data itself, but it's also by providing metadata on that data it should be machine interoperable, readable, so you can actually, as a computer, make use of the data. The metadata can also be described as metadata. The infrastructure that everything lives off can be uh, described as metadata. And if everyone starts doing this, there will be more and more data reusable and less patients have to be involved in research because the data is already there. You can make bigger research groups. Um, but making your data fair is actually a hard thing. And like I said, medical researchers are often very much interested in medical research, but not in semantic interoperability of their data sets. Um, so FIRE can actually greatly help here because the data already gets standardized at the source, gets annotated with the right metadata, and from the source gets forwarded to the uh, data capture platform. If we keep those annotations and the metadata in there and make sure that they get exposed as the final data set as well, it can get published in the end with all the relevant annotations and metadata on it. And that means that the published data set uh, that I talked about earlier that used to be just a plain CSV file can now be a fully annotated semantic data set where each and every data point you know exactly of where it came from, who is allowed to use it, but also whether it's a blood measurement that was taken while sitting while, for 24 hours while laying down, you can very precisely specify what's in your data. Um, so, yeah, the code systems defined at the source will really help making the data fair. But this only works when those code systems are actually using uh, recognized global ontology systems, terminology systems, instead of your local hospital um, laboratory information code set. Because that's only interesting for your local laboratory, uh, for your local hospital. But for global interoperability, that does not work. So, efforts are required to harmonize this and to make sure that we use loin codes, SNOMED codes, or other domain-specific uh, terminology systems for that use case. Um, rounding up, um, I think that FIRE has proven already for us that it can really help speed up the, the research process, uh, especially when it comes to data capture. But patient recruitment is another uh, potential. We are working on a digital consent tool where we want to use FIRE as well device integrations, uh, and that's just a small list of the options to improve medical research with FIRE. What we see is that the uptake of FIRE in uh, Dutch hospitals is really uh, rising quickly. Uh, more and more hospitals are working with FIRE and are interested in implementing servers or exposing the data as FIRE resources. And of course, here in the US, the government is really pushing hard as well. So. Um, there is a lot of um, improvements that we can see for in clinical research based on this uptake in FIRE. And metadata annotation should be a core priority for anyone who is working with FIRE in medical research. If you have any chance when working with FIRE, when exposing data as FIRE, please put efforts in to use international standards instead of your local code sets and collaborate on uh, national or international FIRE profiles to make that happen. And that brings me to the end. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, 
Yes, so the, the, the question is uh, whether the de-identification of the data uh, takes place, or how, how that takes place, basically. Um, in the push uh, architecture with a broker application, your broker application will basically take care of transforming the uh, identifying data into uh, the research identifiers. So there is the broker application is responsible. If you have a fire server, um, the, what we've used so far um, with Castor, the hospitals we've been working with, it's a facade that's actually querying underlying data sources, SQL servers with the research data warehouse. Um, in the research data warehouse, we already have the pseudonyms uh, of these patients because they are registered in the EHR, either via consent mechanism or via another enrollment process. So we know which studies they are in, which uh, pseudonyms they have from the EHR, and that's the only data that's being exposed from the fire server when it translates the queries that are sent to the SQL server into fire messages to us. So you store, <coughs> so you store the big, like the mapping between actual fire ID and, 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 and you know, the de yeah, I you, Usually that, that's stored within the EHR. So we only know the pseudonym as an external research application. We only know the pseudonyms. We have an identifier for the study, for example, diabetes study 001. We know patients 1 to 50 are enrolled in that. Um, these two identifiers, the study identifier and the research identifiers, are actually stored within the EHR and exposed like that. I think the, the, the current challenge with Smart on Fire um, for us, and at least for the hospitals that we're talking with, is the fact that if you are authorized as a researcher, you get a scope back for either observation.read or star.read for a patient. While that is not granular enough, it exposes all the data that's available of that patient. While, um, for example, a quality registry for surgical outcomes should not have all the laboratory data, but only just have the surgery report. Um, Although surgery report is a specific resource, but if we think about observations, uh, lab, lab measurements, you, you want to have a more fine-grained uh, approach on what data you expose. Um. I'm not sure how it works in your EHR, but in terms of like as fields are changing over time and getting updated and more useful for your research study, is the version and things like that to handle any of that, or do you run into that? That's a very good question. So the question is, how do you handle updates within the EHR of the data that you've already imported? Um, right now, we don't have a um, good way to handle that uh, in the sense that it requires the researcher to actually be notified himself when there is an updated uh, uh, culture result, for example. Um, the researcher needs to be notified, and he, they need to actually re-import the data. There is no way how we yet uh, automate the updated value throughout the process. But it should be possible, actually. So far, that's usually what happens. Um, technically, though, it, it shouldn't be that hard because you have your unique identifier of your observation. Uh, if it has an updated result, you should be able to actually map that result and propagate it throughout all systems, basically. Nice, would be very interested to see. Yeah. Okay, um, so there's usually a person in the loop to assure the quality of the data before it goes into a CRF. And it looks like there's no person in the loop here. Um, does that lead to uh, quality problems in the data? Um, there's still, uh, so the question is, um, whether there's a person still in the loop to actually make sure that the data quality is sufficient. Um, that person is still there. Um, like I showed, the incoming fire data has to be processed here and has to be approved by a person. So there is no automation going on there. There's always a manual uh, 
step and the data is always imported by a person that's actually then also recorded in the other trail. Um, besides that, within the CRF, the users already can specify validations uh, and uh, minimum, maximum values uh, that get triggered also with the fire import. So if there are outliers, if there is quality issues, they can actually assess these also uh, on the fly when the data becomes imported. I've learned, uh, so the question is whether Fire and OMOP, whether there's uh, efforts to integrate this with OMOP as well. Um, I've learned about OMOP only recently, so uh, I'm quite enthusiastic, uh, and I think that should definitely be done, yeah. So along the same vein, Um, the question is whether it's still allowed to change the data uh, that have been imported uh, manually in the EDC. Uh, yes, that's allowed. Um, it depends on your study. If you're doing a, a registry for yourself uh, or a small small study, you can configure your study in Castor in such a way that you can just override basically anything you want. If you do a regulated trial and you want to adhere to good clinical practice, you can enable your study that you have to provide a reason and that an automated query gets created if a data value is being changed. So, so that's Okay. Yeah, I think there's also an OMOP talk tomorrow that I plan to attend. Thank you. Yes, so the question is how consent um, is being treated within this system and uh, how it's being persisted. Um, the short answer right now is it's outside of the scope of the systems uh, here in place. Uh, in the Netherlands, informed consent is still required to be uh, a wet signature, is on paper, um, and the consent is being tracked in the EHR. The data is, uh, the, the patient can be removed from the study if consent is withdrawn. And then the data will also not be accessible anymore through the EHR uh, fire server. Um, I hope in the future that we can actually have a consent resource that tracks this directly, um, but we're not there yet. Or at least I haven't seen implementations of it. All right. Thank you very much.